Ever since Ocarina of Time came out, there's been a lot of adventure games that have tried to capture that same Zelda magic. The world, the combat, the dungeons, plenty of companies would all take a stab at it, but during that era, nothing did it quite like Nintendo. That didn't stop others from trying, though, and in 1999, a company named Psygnosis would give it a shot with Kingsley's Adventure. These guys published a lot of DOS and Amiga games like Pugsy and Lemmings, but they're probably most well known for creating the Wipeout series. In the year 2000, they'd merge into Sony Computer Entertainment Liverpool, and they would then pursue developing Formula One and the Wipeout games exclusively for PlayStation. The studio then closed in 2010, but I've heard that some of the developers from the company are still kicking around at Sony, some of which even helped make the Playroom apps for uh, PS4. <laughs> But before all of that, they were just another studio that published a lot of random old games, and they even made a handful of games themselves. It's a little bit difficult to find a comprehensive list of games these people have actually developed online, because every website I go to, it gives me a list of games they've published, including a lot of older Traveler's Tales games, but if there's one game I do know for a fact they did indeed create themselves, it is a little-known PS1 adventure game with elements of platforming called Kingsley's Adventure. I found this game at a flea market, and I literally only bought it because the character on the cover is, like, kind of adorable. I also saw the word platforming on the back of the case, and, you know, I'm the platformer man, so I just had to buy it like an idiot. Uh, five apprenticeship quests teach the basics. What is that, like, tutorials? 41 individual game tunes! 50 interactive characters. They're really scraping the bottom of the barrel for these bullet points here, but, you know, let's, uh... Whee! Alright, uh, not a bad title screen. It's pretty cliche with, you know, like the camera circling around the castle, but it gets the job done, so whatever. Uh, the music kind of sounds like it's from RuneScape, though. <laughs> The game begins with a CG cutscene of a puppet show that gives us a little bit of backstory, so there's an evil rat named Bad Custard who stole the Queen's Book of Magic and used it to transform the castle's four knights into the four dark evil knights. With the knights all out of commission, the king and queen start training a young fox for knighthood so he can then go stop Bad Custard and save the kingdom. Bad Custard, oh man, they really didn't put too much thought into that name there. Like, his first name is Bad. Like. I would have called him, like, Custard's fine, like maybe Custard the Rat? I don't know, why bad though? Stop, freeze! Identify yourself! Oh, oh you're looking at Bad Brad. What's up, Bad Brad? Maybe he's related to Strong Bad, I don't know. Anyway, the gameplay starts in the castle of the Fruit Kingdom, where the king and queen are both rabbits. I like the carrot theme they've got going on through at the castle, especially the castle gates, that's really nice and cute. Though it begs the question, why is this the Fruit Kingdom if the only food references are to vegetables? I don't think they put much thought into this either. So the controls really aren't what I was expecting, especially from a later PS1 game. Kingsley plays with tank controls, you steer him by pushing left and right and walk forward forward and backwards by pushing up and down. It's made tolerable with the ability to strafe with the L2 and R2 buttons. You can also strafe while moving, so it's it's kind of like having full control, except it controls more like an N64 FPS, you know, like in, instead of using a C buttons to strafe, you use the shoulder buttons here. I don't really think these controls are suited too well for a game like this, and I'm not inherently against tank controls. I mean, I think they work perfectly fine in survival horror games like Silent Hill and anything else with fixed camera angles, honestly, but for an action-adventure game with platforming? No. I mean, again, the strafing makes it tolerable for generally getting around, but there's been plenty of times when I just had a really hard time making completely simple jumps. For the most part, platforms are fairly big to compensate, but every now and then, the game will expect you to land on something that's either moving or very small, and in quick succession, it becomes irritatingly cumbersome to perform such a simple task. Outside of moving around with the uh, control stick, you can also jump with the X button. It's just like a dinky little hop. Uh, nothing too elaborate. It's mostly an adventure game with light platforming after all, so I didn't really expect much from that. Uh, but yeah, square swings your sword and circle uses the shield. So uh, yeah, the game's also got a little bit of combat, and I really don't think sword and shield combat can really get any simpler than this. I guess the idea is to block and then parry after the enemy's attack bounces off of your shield, but you can really just run up and mash the square button, and nine times out of ten, you'll just beat them without any problems. There's a couple of extra 
extra weapons you can obtain as well. There's an axe and a larger sword. Uh, they're really just like better versions of the previous weapon, and they don't really offer anything more than just a damage boost. So once you have the best weapon, you won't be using the previous ones anymore. And that's a little bit of a shame. I wish there was some sort of trade-off, you know, like in uh, Ocarina of Time, for example, the Big Goron Sword. It's much longer and stronger than the Master Sword, but as a trade-off, you can't use the shield. I think something like that would have been cool. There's also a crossbow you can use for taking out dudes from a distance. Uh, this thing is, like, way too helpful for taking out the big dudes. Like, they don't even stand a chance. You just boom, boom, boom. They're dead right there. Good thing, too, because these big guys are the only enemies that could really manage to land a hit on me. The crossbow is also used for shooting switches that'll trigger several mechanisms. Again, just like Ocarina of Time. Uh, you can only hold 10 arrows at any given time, though, and for some reason you can't pick up more unless you have zero left. Like, if you've got a couple left, the pickup is translucent and you can't get it. So I found myself mashing the square button and just emptying my quiver every time I wanted to pick more up. I don't I don't know why. It's also very strange that they teach you how to use the crossbow during the game's tutorial just minutes into the game, yet you don't get this thing until the very final dungeon. So why did why do we learn how to do this this early? The game is structured similarly to that of a typical 3D Zelda from the time. You know, like you find a village full of people in need, you complete that area's dungeon, and then you obtain one of the several magical items that you need for your quest. In Kingsley's case, it's a series of gear that he needs to become a true knight. I always kind of thought that becoming a true knight should be a matter of uh, self-betterment, like training yourself, overcoming your obstacles, and proving your worth, but uh, here you just kind of gotta, you just gotta get some things. I'm a true knight. I got some, I got a new pair of pants. True knight. Progressing through the game is a little bit too straightforward for my taste. I mean, I like having some sort of direction, but here I feel like they baby you just a little bit too much. Like, every time you finish a dungeon, you go back to the king and queen, and they just open the gate to the next town for you. There's no real sense of exploring the world, it's more like a level select. This is definitely a game that was made for much younger players, and not just because of the adorable graphics. There's plenty of cute games out there that I find still have a lot of appeal to adults. It just really holds your hand as you go along. The town areas aren't really that explorable either. You can see what's inside each building and you can talk to the NPCs, but the areas themselves, they just aren't designed elaborately enough to be fun to look around. Exploration? Like, what exploration? There's none of that in this game. You may as well cross that off the back. Every area is just a big, empty, circular map with a bunch of buildings on it. There's no reason to look around. There's no hidden dungeons to find. There's no side quests. There's nothing more to these towns than just a handful of buildings to go in. The NPCs can be pretty great, though. They all have colorful and fun designs, and the dialogue can actually be pretty funny. Like these caffeine addicts in the coffee shop. This one complains about his caffeine headaches and decides that more coffee is the appropriate measure to take. And look at this little dog dude, he's boinking around, he's got a big old grin. Or maybe he's, I don't know, he looks angry, but man, I love this dog. There's two of them! You got a blue one and you got a black one, you call him Sonic and Shadow. The dog. The characters are definitely one of the game's biggest strengths. The entire game actually looks pretty good. A lot of flat shading with very vibrant colors that pop out. It still looks pretty good. The NPCs all speak with that iconic Banjo-Kazooie jarbo, which is always a really nice touch. The attention to detail in so many areas is pretty admirable. There's a lot of unique objects to fill every room. There's a very detailed dollhouse in the castle, all the way to this billiards table and this... Uh, uh, maybe it's a bar, whatever it is, man, like, they got the right props to set the mood for sure. Sea Town, for example, they've got everything they need for that proper sailor vibe. The people here are being troubled by a pirate named Captain Gallagher. Because of his pirate malarkey, no one's been able to do trade with Sea Town. The scenarios these villages face sometimes are pretty great. The second town has a dragon that's been stealing all of their food, and at first it's like, yeah, okay, that's a pretty whatever situation, until you find out that he's even too lazy to go to the town so he uses a big conveyor belt to bring all the food to him. And how do you get all the food back? You hit the reverse switch on the machine. That's, <laughs> that's so good. The third town was easily my favorite. It's run by a bunch of monks that brew root beer for the townsfolk. And then an imposter posing as a monk infiltrates the root beer church and poisons the brewery, which makes all the townsfolk sick. But there's also a cult of coffee drinkers in town as well. And they have not been affected by this because they're too busy getting hopped up on 
caffeine. It's like this bizarre social ecosystem where people of different religions don't get along and kind of butt heads, but just replace religion with whether you drink root beer or coffee. I couldn't tell you why, but I am in love with that idea. These were hands down my favorite parts of this game, was just going to a brand new village and talking to everybody and hearing about their stupid situations that Kingsley will then deal with by completing the area's dungeon. These are fairly straightforward. They're mostly made of linear corridors that connect a handful of larger rooms that will have very light elements of puzzle. Well, elements so light that I don't even really know if you can consider them puzzles. The only real puzzle in this game is when you have to push these barrels around to uncover color-coded Roman numerals and interpret that as a button combination. I guess there's also this one with the giant piano, you know, we have to hit the keys in the right order, but it's so easy to find it by yourself that I just guessed it by trial and error without even having to find the song. Sometimes you'll find keys that you'll use to open doors and chests, you know, like just like Legend of Zelda. Again, I actually had a fairly hard time opening these doors and chests too, and these wall switches as well, like anything you interact with, you do it with the square button, which is the same button you use to swing your weapon. So earlier on in the game, I would go up to these things and I would hit square and instead Kingsley would just swing a sword and not hit the switch and not open the door. There have actually been times when it was so unresponsive that I thought I had the wrong key and I did a bunch of backtracking to look for another one, but no, I actually did have the correct key. The game just would not recognize the input. It also really really doesn't help that the switches are all flat textures that do not protrude from the wall at all, which makes the visual information a little bit unclear the first handful of times you see them. There's a sweet spot to it. You have to be right in the middle, and you also have to come to a complete stop. You have to not be touching the D-pad, and you cannot be touching the stick before you hit square. Once I got a feel for it, it was a total non-issue, but for a good half of the game, it was such a basic thing that was irritatingly difficult to pull off. These dungeons all have those rooms that can be such a pain in the ass too. Like this one here requires platforming that is much too precise for the control scheme we're given. I kept falling down over and over because I have to do this with tank controls. Like are you... The worst part of the game is the fourth and final dungeon. This was the first part of the game that I actually got a game over in three times. I didn't even realize you had lives in this game until then because this game is so easy that I never died. I was actually wondering what those coins did for the longest time and I was getting confused why every now and then it would reset back to zero. I never bought anything with them, where are they going? But it turns out that collecting 50 gives you a one-up, there's no purchasing of anything in the game. Pretty weird collectible for lives though, coins, you'd think that'd be for buying stuff? I mean like in Mario it's coins and that's normal because that's Mario but in a game like in a, in a medieval game, you know, like you usually use them to buy stuff It's like an RPG ish kind of adventure game So I don't know that, that just kind of struck me as weird is all I was going after these like mad in that fourth dungeon because it's so easy to die here This room in particular you have to avoid these swinging saw blades and you have to land on these very small platforms It's hard enough as it is to get from one end of the room to the other without losing too much health But then you got to deal with these two rats with crossbows but the worst part is that you have to hit this button to temporarily open a gate and then rush all the way back across before it closes. So not only do you have to make all of these precise jumps onto small platforms with tank controls, but you have to do it fast too. It is so hard to do without landing in the green lava over and over and quickly draining all of your health. What's worse is that later on in the dungeon, the game just decides that the green lava now takes an entire life. Like why? It only took out a couple of hearts before. Or why make the dungeon more needlessly punishing as it goes on? Man, I seriously have not felt a difficulty spike like this in years. This entire game is like for babies, but this last dungeon, oh my god, dude. Ironically, the boss of every dungeon is really easy. You, you just attack him until he's dead. Like, it's as simple as that. No element of puzzle, no real intricate combat. You just mash that square button until he falls over. Once you're done with the four dungeons, you'll still have to find and defeat the four Dark Knights. This is the only part of the game that has you actually exploring and somewhat figuring things out for yourself. The King and Queen don't know exactly where they are, so you have to return to previously visited areas and find them for yourself. You'll gather information 
information from NPCs and look for their hideouts based on that. This was kinda nice, it actually felt more like an adventure game. I mean, hearing about a winch that nobody's strong enough to operate from townsfolk, and then making the connection yourself that you gotta go back with these new gloves of might that you find later, well, that's a lot more satisfying than just having the king and queen tell you what to do. Well, it would've been this way if Kingsley didn't have to make it painfully obvious with this line of dialogue, like, come on game, can you just let me figure out something for myself, please? The four Dark Knights are actually a tad more difficult than previous bosses and will require a sliver of strategy. One boss is a bull that'll have you dodging as he charges you, and there's a bald eagle that you have to shoot down with your crossbow. I know that's not very complicated, but like I said, a sliver of strategy. After playing the four previous bosses, I was hungry for at least something, right? And that's something. Once you've beaten up all the four Dark Knights, all that's left is to take on Bad Custard. The King and Queen open one last level for you, which, well, it's not even a level, it's not even a dungeon, it's just a boss fight, and, uh, yeah, I, I guess it's a little bit more interesting than previous fights. There's now multiple levels to the arena, and you'll have to use these elevators to track Custard down and land some hits on him. An easy fight still, but it's easily the most fun fight and the most interesting fight in the game, so I guess it's nice that they did save it for last. Custard claims that he shall return some day, but then Kingsley knocks him back into a boiling pot of custard, ending him once and for all. We then read. oh, oh, that's the credits, okay, that was extremely abrupt, oh my lord, no falling action, no, like, I, I don't know, like a king could have been like, good job, Kingsley, you did it, you, you saved the day, let's have a party, I don't know, they, they just kind of stand there and the credits go by. And what is up with this credits music? I, I mean, it's bumping as hell, but it's so unfitting. Like, this sounds like something from an EDM concert, not a medieval game. And uh, yeah, that's uh, Kingsley's Adventure. Um, it's okay, I guess. It's short, too. Like, it only took me five hours to get through. It's definitely a game for little kids. Uh, the graphics are fantastic, and the characters are super fun and cute, but I don't know, other than that, it didn't really have a whole lot going for it. It wants so desperately to be Zelda, but it doesn't make a shred of effort to try and be Zelda. The dungeons are incredibly straightforward, the combat is kinda dull, and the difficulty spike in the fourth dungeon made me want to stop playing. The highlight of the game was definitely roaming the towns and interacting with the NPCs, so I really wish they had more of that. More exploration, quest lines, and have you actually figuring things out yourself, instead of the game just babying you along. There were glimpses of that in the game's final act, but it was so so brief and underutilized. And I understand the game is for children, but so is Ocarina of Time. That game was nothing like this. You would have characters point the general direction, but the rest you found out on your own by either exploring or by chatting up the locals. And I had no trouble figuring that game out as a kid. I know kids are stupid, but that doesn't mean they're dumb. You, you know what I mean by that. <laughs> <laughs> I would struggle to call this a terrible game, though. It was kind of fun throughout most of it, you know, fourth dungeon aside, but it's just so painfully uninteresting is the game's problem. Like, every B-grade title I've ever played, well, at least most of them, has managed to do at least one thing that's, like, kind of unique that I can walk away from it and remember and look back on it and be like, yeah, that was kind of a cool thing, but Kingsley's Adventure only limits itself to mechanics that have already been executed in the Zelda series, both 2D and 3D, except it executes it all so much less interestingly and less intricately. You know, it's a cute as hell game, and I'm a sucker for that, but I don't know. It just never tries to break free of that tiny, tiny bubble it limits itself to, so I'm sorry, Kingsley, but cute looks are nice, but sometimes you really just need more than that. Uh, hello, welcome to the End Slate. If you want to check out another platformer game that I've reviewed, you can uh, check the link right here. And uh, if you'd maybe like to support the show and help me continue doing it as a full-time job, you can donate as little as $1 a month to my Patreon and get access to the Nitrad podcast and some pretty wacky blooper reels. Love you guys, and I'll see you again soon.